Thank you. Everybody ready? It's five o'clock. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I call this regular meeting of Kittitas County Public Hospital District Number One Board of Commissioner. Uh, regular meeting to order. Um, it's July twenty fifth, twenty twenty four, and um, we have the agenda. Everybody has a copy of the agenda, I believe. Any changes? or additions to the agenda or anything to be pulled from the consent agenda? If not, uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. Oh, I'm sorry, that uh, my mistake. Uh, just under education board reports, I'll talk briefly, uh, and Terry may also talk briefly about uh, our uh, the World Health, Rural Healthcare Leadership Conference that we attended in June. So with that amendment. Move to approve with uh, amendment. Good, uh, Erica, Bob, second. Okay, uh, any further additions, James? All those in favor of the amended agenda, please say aye. 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 All right. And then we have the consent agenda with minutes from our last meeting, the approval of checks and the finance committee minutes. Any uh, any comments or anything before we take a motion to approve the consent agenda? I would just mention we did not have the foundation report this month. There will probably be the foundation reports in this month. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I'll move to approve if you're ready for it. Okay, motion from John. I'll second. Second from Terry. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Uh, before we get to uh, the rest of the agenda, I just want to take a moment to recognize uh, the incredible work that IT did uh, here at KVH during the CrowdStrike emergency. Uh, as I understand it, um, started at uh, last Thursday at 11.33 p.m., and a bunch of uh, IT folks were working sort of uh, frantically until 4 p.m. the following day. And as I understand it, uh, things were down for only about 90 minutes. Lab and, in uh, lab and imaging were keeping stuff up by hand-delivering uh, things. And, and as I understand it, nothing was canceled. No appointments or anything were canceled the following day. Um, and uh, in case uh, you guys didn't know, and I didn't know it prior to hearing about it, but somebody in IT had to get on each and every computer station and add a patch. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, actually, eliminate, eliminate an update was the oh. issue um, from CrowdStrike. And so CrowdStrike, our uh, security vendor, um, as you probably read in the news, um, Sent, it's not truly a patch update. It's uh, something with their sensors. So on every workstation, we have a CrowdStrike sensor um, that alerts us if there's something going on with the computer. That was where the issue resides. So we had to basically go into every computer, um, un unlock each computer. It gets bit locked. So there's a 30-digit code that needs to go in individually to each computer. They're all unique to that specific computer unlock that and then remove the uh, the patch that was in there, a little, a file. So um, yeah, we had a great teamwork. Uh, about six of us came in, uh, worked through the night. I think it was, I think we calculated out about 25 hours total. Uh, we had planned it where others would come in um, at 4.30 in the morning when we knew we were getting fairly close and we still had some clinics to uh, resolve. Um, and then we knew, um, you know, further along that we would need staff here during the day. So it was totally a teamwork. You know, there are other people that said, oh, you should have called me. But it was planned that we kind of had this sequence um, and to maintain that uh, throughout the throughout the next business day. Right. So um, all went well. So I uh, appreciate everybody's patience. And, um, you know, I think there are still businesses out there that are still um going through this or resolving the issue. So kudos to everybody at KVH. And can I just mention, um, we did not cancel any clinics. Correct. We did not cancel surgeries, elective or otherwise, um, which I think makes us unique in the region that IT was able to get us up and running as quickly as they were. And we had hospitals all over the state on alert, refusing admissions, and that was never the case at KVH. So truly exercising those downtime procedures, knowing what to do when all the systems were down. Um, but more than anything that IT 
the IT team that was going from workstation to workstation, 25 hours. It's amazing. How Another one of those things where uh, all this work behind the scenes and the patient experience seems unchanged. They just, uh, they keep their appointments, they have their surgeries, everything goes like that. But to to keep that uh, appearance, reality of, of sort of organization and care requires a lot of work behind the scenes. And in this case, uh, a whole lot of work um, over the course of one frantic night, right? Did I miss, yep. did you say how many workstations had to be? Uh, I don't know. I don't think we said, Jeff, uh, you guys had to had to deal with every workstation. How many are we talking about? Uh, so we have about 1,100 end user devices. We have about 800 that are in the system um, that are, you know, within the, the clinics and other areas. Um, so we did, we prioritized what we were doing um, and really focused on patient care areas first. Um, so, you know, administration, um, other office areas um, were kind of left for basically, you know, at the end of that, if we still had time and we were still okay in, in getting those resolved, but we really, really focused on patient care, hospital, um, caring for the people that were in the hospital, number one, but then also, you know, following up with the next day for our patients coming in. So, um, so we kind of had a plan um, in how we were doing that. So, um, everything worked out well. Uh, please pass on to your team uh, the board's uh, gratitude for all the work you guys did on that. Thank you. Yeah, to totally well. Thank you very much. Uh, awesome work. Yep. <laughs> okay. Quick, quick response. I was online when it happened, and my I got the blue screen, and about five minutes later, I got a text from Jeff that. And uh, admin takes it. That's going on. So mm. very quick response. Quick response. All right. Mm. Great to hear. Um, all right. So we have uh, now. It's time for public comment and announcements. If there's anyone here who would like to make a public comment, uh, please begin by stating your name and where you're from, and please try to keep your comments to about three minutes. Uh, also, keep in mind that. The uh, board does not respond to comments here in public session, but we will um, uh, respond to you or have some the appropriate person to respond to you uh, after, uh, you know, in subsequent days from the meeting. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment or an announcement? You know, I, I would like to um, uh, welcome Rosemary Meyer. She's from the League of Women Voters. Has everyone met her yet? I think the board members okay. have. But so she was director of aging long-term care for a long time and just an amazing person. So glad to have her here representing the women voters. Yeah, I think this is a great initiative that you guys have where you're trying to, to have representatives go to, to a lot of the governmental affairs and, and report back to the league. So anyway, it's really nice uh, to have you here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And uh, as as we've said in emails, and as Mandy, I'm sure has said to you, uh, just feel free to reach out if if you or the League of Women Voters needs uh, needs anything from us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else uh, like to make a public comment or announcement? Okay. Uh, hearing from no one, we'll start then with a the presentation. Uh, Julie Peterson is going to give us an educational uh, presentation about the. Uh, uh, hospital District 2, um, medical one ambulance. So this is, uh, you guys have a card, I think, in front of you about this. And you also have the community benefit report for Hospital District 2 in front of you. And Michelle, remind me when the public, the benefit report will be out for District 1. Um, that will be wrapped up with Crystal and Design next week, and then it will hit the printers. Okay. And those will be on the websites for the respective hospital districts. But I am here making this presentation in my capacity as the superintendent at Hospital District 2. Um, uh, Proposition 1 is on the ballot uh, for August 6. It is a levy lid lift for the EMS portion of the taxing that Hospital District 2 does in Upper County. And just to remind everybody, as a public hospital district, um, we are allowed to educate on an issue like this, not to advocate. So we have um, Rhonda as the strategic 
uh, planning officer and hospital lister too, and Jeff Shear as the operations manager up there have been going to the meetings, the city council meetings, the Rotary, Rotary meetings, Kiwanis, educating them on the importance and the role of like one in Upper County and the importance of the levy. So again, the message of the hospital district is remember to vote. We have a citizens committee and some other folks that are active in the community on their own time who are reminding people to vote yes. But this presentation this evening is about the importance of the levy and reminding people if you live in Upper County to vote. So Upper Kittitas County Medic One Ambulance, a service of Public Hospital District 2. You all know Kittitas County is wall to wall hospital districts. We're in Hospital District 1. Hospital District 2's primary business is operating Medic One. Hospital District 2, like Hospital District 1, has five elected commissioners. Of course, we currently have a vacancy with the passing of Park Vic. So Right now they're operating with four commissioners. And this is the crew of hospital district two's medic one service outside of their new ambulance station at station 99 in Cleelum, adjacent to family medicine Cleelum. So back in 1973, Hospital District 2 started providing EMS services in Upper Kittitas County. The name of that service is Medic One. And again, the primary business of Hospital District 2 is providing Medic One services. They were running six-year levies beginning in 1992. Um, and then Medic One in 1996 became a licensed ALS, which is a paramedic service. So up in Upper County, and you can see a little bit more detail about this in a moment, um, they coordinate, they partner and collaborate with seven different fire districts up there. So KVFR is a more urban, suburban sort of design service where EMS is embedded in five. In Upper County, we have independent, independent fire districts and then one uh, ALS ambulance service, which is Medic One. So they coordinate and collaborate with all of the fire districts up there. Three of the fire districts up there also have BLS or volunteer ambulance services as well. So it's a little more confusing. It's a typical old school rural delivery system for EMS in Upper County. And then in 2016, for the first time, the voters approved a permanent EMS levy for Medic One, and it was at 25 cents. And we have not increase that levy since 2016. So it's been subject to that 1% cap. And you'll hear later that because of that, the I'm an initiative 1% cap, that levy is no longer at 25 cents, but it has fallen to below 12 cents per thousand. Medic One Ambulance is funded 55% through transport revenues and 45% through tax levies. So as that the service area has become more and more populated up there as we see more people coming over I-90. They have become busier. The demands that, of course, labor is becoming more expensive. The demands on the apparatus, the need to have additional housing for our crews and things like that is really stressing them financially. It's important to note that when you're transporting a patient, when KITCOM tones out an ambulance from the station to the site, is not a billable service. So you then get out of your ambulance with a paramedic and an EMS who've arrived on the scene. They evaluate the patient, they may treat the patient, and then the patient and the paramedic together decide whether they're going to transport the patient and where the patient's going to go. So about 73% of the time those patients come to KBH, but about 50% of the time, that transport or that call does not result in a transport. So we turn around, we come back to the station and there's no charge for that. When we do transport, say we pick up an injured skier up at Snoqualmie and we bring them down to KVH, we deliver them from Snoqualmie to KVH, is a billable transport. They offload exchange information with, with the emergency department, turn around and drive back to Cleelum. Again, without a patient on board, that trip from KVH back to Station 99 is not billable. 
So 50% of the time, the work that Medic One and the ambulance service performs is not billable. So 45% of the revenues come from levies, and that's what we're looking at this year. So over the years, this is the trajectory of the mill rate that they've had up there. So now, again, because of that 1% cap, it's at under 12 cents or just about 11 cents per thousand. The ask of the levy lid lift is to take it back to 25 cents. 76% of the costs of operating Medic One are people, are the people that we employ up there. 8% um, is maintenance and service, mostly on the rigs and the, the building up there, supplies, minor equipment, and others such as utilities, purchase services for kit comp, things like that. But similar to most services like the hospital, 76% is wages and benefits that go to the paramedics and the EMTs that work up there. And they are members of IAFF uh, 1488. So they are union uh, members. Julie, can you explain, I don't quite understand how the 25 cents per thousand as a permanent levy, how that's gone down as so, cost of living? No, every year we go through a calculation of the property values and, and we do that down here yeah. as well. But we go through the calculation of um, applying the of the new property values in Upper County, but we are limited to a one percent increase overall. So since the property values and the growth have outstripped one percent, that twenty five cent cap has fallen every year. That's why you so frequently see fire and EMS levies come back to the voters for a lit lift is to get it back up to the 25 cents. So you're not- To a voter initiative? Yeah, it was, uh, uh, Tim Iman was a gentleman who for probably about a decade in Washington state was very active in the property tax arena and tax arena, trying to minimize things like that. So it, you know, when you get a permanent levy, you're not done. You have to periodically really. go back and, and ask the voters. And because we're only going to the 25 cents, that was originally approved by the voters. We only need a simple majority to do that. But one of the things we need to think up, think about up there is a new ambulance costs about $365,000. So that's the chassis, the box, and everything that goes in it. They're good for about 150,000 miles, and we have to order a new one every year. So it used to be that it would take six to eight months to get a new ambulance. Our 2025 ambulance is already on order. They take 14 to 18 months to get now. And because of supply chain disruptions and, and all the things we know that have plagued supply chains since the pandemic, it's taking longer and longer and it's more and more expensive to replace our ambulances. So Medic One run, keeps typically five ambulances at any given time, two first out ambulances, two backup ambulances, and one that they use for hotspots, like when they send one of the units up during the winter to Snoqualmie and, and when they do some extra staffing. So we try to keep five ambulances at all times, but every time we order one of these, we spend about $365,000 Medic One staffing, we have 12 paramedics, 16 BLS EMTs, and I'm particularly proud of the fact that two-thirds of our staff live and work in Kittitas County. So these folks typically work 48-hour shifts, and that's true of most fire paramedics um, and paramedics. So it's not unusual for these crews to live on the west side or live in Spokane, come in and do their 48 hours and leave. We've really focused, similar to Hospital District 1, in Hospital District 2, we focus on hiring local folks, developing local folks as much as possible so that we keep those good, benefited family wage jobs in Kittitas County. So two-thirds is a really good number for us. And we have Jeff Shear, who's the full-time, for the first time in 2024, he is full-time operations manager up there. So this is Hospital District 2 inside the black line there. These are the fire departments that, again, those crews have an outstanding relationship with the fire departments. 
with the, the teams that they cross cover, have mutual aid agreements with, but they are the only ALS transport service, ambulance service for that entire area. So great working relationships with the fire departments. There are three fire departments that actually staff EMS cars up there and fire district seven has paid members of their staff as well. I think Cleelum might. Michelle or Rhonda, does Cleelum have paid EMTs as well, firefighters? Uh, no, they're not paid, they're volunteer, but they are um, BLS transport rather than the South Cleelum. I think there's a mistake on that. Okay, so it's only Fire 7 that has the paid. Julie, yeah. could you verify that Hospital District 2 is only the black lines and everything else on there is Hospital District 1? That's correct. Hospital District 1 is here. Hospital District 2 is up there. It's okay. about 800 square miles. Yeah, so Hospital District 2 is about one third of the county, it looks like. Yeah. So yeah, again, we rely on relationships, partnerships, and collaboration to get the work done. 911 call in any area in Upper County is dispatched, Medic 1, Advanced Life Support Ambulance with a paramedic and an EMT. So we have two ambulances, 24-7, paramedic, EMT, Jeff's up there as well. And uh, as I said, when we have hot spots or particularly busy, we'll have people on call. Basic life support from the appropriate fire district is dispatched and may respond inside their fire district only. Medic 1 ALS and any responding BLS fire and unit arrive to care for the patient. The decision then is made to transport the patient to a hospital. That's made between the patient and the paramedic who's on the scene. If the patient is transported to a hospital, the patient is then billed for that service. If the patient is not transported, we get our staff turn around and come back to the station. Unit 991, a minimum of one paramedic and one EMT. It is staffed out of station 99, and that's the one that's adjacent to Family Medicine Cleveland. Unit 993, again, a paramedic and an EMT that's staffed out of uh, Fire District 7, Station 73, which is right off of Gulf Road. And 992, the third unit is high volume weekends. And again, we move that up to the ski areas in the winter if we think we might need them up there. Stay, again, staffed out of Station 99. Upper Kittitas County, Medic 1 Advanced Life Support, two units available 24-7. Backup life support from Clay Allen, uh, Fire District 7, and Snowpass District 51. KBFR will provide backup ALF. KBFR is the only other advanced life support transport service in the county. They will provide mutual aid and backup to Medic 1 if they have a unit and they're able to deploy someone up there. So it's mostly the fire districts that are within a uh, hospital district two that help cover KBFRs usually kept pretty busy down to the hospital district one. These are the number of patients that we've seen over time. And one of the things I like to tell people during a uh, new employee orientation is there's about 10,000 residents who live in Upper County. There's 30 million people a year who come over Snoqualmie Pass and are in the charge of Medic 1 and, for that matter, KVH while they're traveling through Kittitas County. So anytime there's an event on I-90 in that area, it's Medic 1 that responds. Uh, this is where transports go. Again, KVH gets about 73% of them, but they go to the closest hospital with the appropriate level of care. So if you're up on Snoqualmie, on the past side, it's probably going to be uh, Swedish Issaquah or Snoqualmie. So folks picked up on the past may go that direction. Again, we may get part of the way into King County and do a handoff with a King County medic unit. Um, but then some of those transports based on acuity or trauma are going to go to Harborview or Children's. Um, and you can see the rest of the distribution there. But the lion's share of them come to KVH for evaluation and treatment. If we do a handoff at the pass with King County, King, King County gets to bill, is that correct? Um, King County, yes, by and large, they do. 
uh, strengths and successes. It is, as I said, a consolidated EMS system. Uh, Medic One is the consolidated EMS system out there. And one of the reasons that's important to this presentation is we've seen a number of fire district levies that have emphasized EMS as part of the service that they provide. Again, like a fire district seven does provide EMS services. It is VLS service. It is not a paramedic. So they aid ALS, they aid medic one, and they operate only within fire district seven. So if you're looking for someone to cover all of Upper Kittitas County, that is medic one. Highly skilled, dedicated paramedics, and they truly are. They live and work in that community. It's integrated with our fire-based services, partnerships with all the medical systems, and it is a consistent and flexible model. Do you think if we're getting a, a new ambulance, that because we took new transports over there all the time. Right. So it doesn't, I mean, it seems kind of, I could see being out of service and with only limited ambulance. Right. But they go ahead and take that patient to wherever they're going to go because we have a backup ambulance that's going to... So we have we report and track every month what we call zero hours when all of our ambulances are in route somewhere, have a patient somewhere, could be out of our service area altogether. So we're sitting there hoping we don't get another call. If we have our two ambulances um, are both on calls, and we get a third call, that's called a past call. So Medic One will tell Kitcom, we don't have an ambulance to serve. Jeff will scramble, try to see if he can get somebody, but that's when we'll call for mutual aid. So we'll call one of those BLS services to help or reach down to KBFR and see if they can assist. But we do track those zero hours when we know we don't have another ambulance to go out and help me. I'm gonna say it's about 20%. Does that feel about right? I think it's about 20% of the time we're hoping we don't get another call. But um, thankfully, past calls are few and far between. So August 6th, uh, Proposition uh, 1 is the levy lid lift again to move from 11 cents back up to that 25 cents. It would take effect January 1st, 2025. It returns it to the 2016 voter approved 25 cents per thousand. The average increase to a homeowner in Upper County will be about $71. Um, we are unable to cover the cost of the EM serv EMS service right now without that levy. And don't forget to vote on August 6th. Any questions, questions uh, for Julie? Any idea how much revenue the current levy brings in this last year? For about 1.3 million between, we have a, a hospital levy up there in addition to the EMS levy. This levy lid lift is focused on the EMS levy, not hospital district two's uh, regular property tax up there. So it's about 1.3. This would generate about, I believe, 900,000 for Long as it's been, since, since it's been at an effect of 25 cents rate. 2017. Might be a little comfy in the floor, great, but hopefully they. I think probably we did try, we did go to the voters, I think it was two years ago, with both of the levies, the hospital levy and the EMS levy, and asked the voters to approve a lid lift to 35 cents, which required a super majority on the EMS levy rather than 25 cents, which requires a simple majority. So we got the simple majority a couple of years ago. What we didn't get was the super majority. So this is a more modest request and hopefully more in keeping with what the taxpayers and hospital district to feel they can do. And to, to Bob's question earlier, so in 2016, if somebody had a home worth 400,000, they'd get you know, a, a, an amount based on this 0.25 per thousand dollars. Then what you're saying the next year, you know, if the house were 500000 it could only go up by 1% of whatever that original amount was. That's, That's what's causing the problem? That's correct. And now the house is worth 800000 It's It's taxed like it's at 420000 or something. Right. Okay. It's, it's, so that's why, because of the property value increase in Upper County, that's why you see such a steep slope, a steep decrease. How does that work with unapproved land and then 
the loop builds, does it get, does this evaluate? That's called new construction. And it, and that's calculated into your property tax increase every year in addition to the 1%. So brand new, new construction, if you're allowed to tax at the existing mill rate, so it'd be 0.11, but you're allowed to get all of that on the new construction. It's not part of the 1%. Not part of that 1% is the That's correct. value increase once it's built. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Fine. Thank you. Thanks. 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 All right. So next up, uh, we'll start our reports and dashboards with uh, quality, Mandy Olson, your quality officer, Mandy. So um, <clears throat> my report is in the packet. Um, I, I really don't have anything. I'm really excited to talk about my measure for uh, this month. So that's, unless you have questions about my report, I'll like jump right into that. We want to dig into infections. Ready. <laughs> Ready. Uh, yeah. So, um, and I'm this, sorry, I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, Mandy, I didn't mean to move forward too fast. Anybody on the, on the board have any questions about the, about the report, about the dashboard before we get to the specific, um, addressing hospital? Mm -hmm. They good and it does touch on you know one piece of what is in my report too about right. um improvement opportunities very good no i'm eager to dig in okay of course all right uh thank you um, well um and i just i want to say thank you too for doing this because i've really enjoyed preparing for this and it is um uh, julie's right there is a lot behind each of these measures um a lot of work that people all over the organization do to to demonstrate our quality or to talk about it. So it's it's really something I enjoy to be able to talk about it. But um, so hospital acquired infections is actually a broad group of cases. And um, it only includes cases that are in the hospital. So not cases in the clinics, not in home health or hospice, um, and not in the e emergency department even, or an outpatient um, surgery. So these are inpatient infections. It's related to infections uh, where patients might have a urinary catheter, certain types of intravascular devices like central lines or what they're called, um, ventilators or surgeries. Um, so the typical ones you may have heard are CAUTIs. That's a catheter associated urinary tract infection. A CLABC, that's a central line associated bloodstream infection. Uh, VAE, or uh, they used to call them VAPs, but those are ventilator-associated events. Um, and these are terms that um, CDC says. So these are these are CDC terms, or an SSI, or a surgical site infection. Since 2020, we have also included on this measure, on our dashboard of this hospital-acquired infections, um, other hospital-acquired infections like C. diff, so when a patient came into the hospital and did not have C. difficile infection and they acquired C. difficile here with us or COVID um, or other multi-drug resistant organisms, so someone came in not having that and then they had that or urinary tract infections that are not associated with a catheter. So someone comes in for care for some reason, maybe a stroke, some something, and while they're here, they develop a urinary tract infection. So how do we decide, oh, they, they end up on this dashboard saying we had one or nothing? It's all based on criteria from the National Health and Safety Network, or NHSN, which is a part of the CDC. Um, and that's where a whole system where hospitals, all hospitals have to report this data and these cases. Um, so CDC has an entire book. Uh, with multiple chapters on each section. So pages and pages and pages of specifications on how you count, how you measure, how you monitor for these things. And um, and and then, you know, like each data point, um, what, what counts as the time of infection? Is it a superficial infection? Is it a deep tissue infection? Is it an organ space infection? So all of this is spelled out in huge specifications manuals. Um, so part of 
the work in becoming a certified, certified in infection control, as Anna Scarlett, our infection preventionist is, is understanding all of this criteria and specifications for what, what is a surgical site infection? What is, uh, you know, a cauti or a clapsy? So we're not, some of these that are on our dashboard, we are required to report and others we're not. We decide to report on this dashboard more infections than we're required to report to NHSN because we feel like it's important to monitor that. Um, so for example, uh, all total hip arthroscopies, all total knee arthroscopies, colon resections, and hysterectomies must be reported to NHSN. That's required for all hospitals. But we also look at if you had an appendicitis and had an appendectomy and then had a, an infection from that, we, we look at that. And that's on your our dashboard here. So we're, uh, I, I guess, overly critical or we, we monitor all kinds of infections, even though that's not necessarily what's reported uh, nationally or to the Washington State Hospital Association comparison report. They, own, they also do not look at superficial surgical site infections, they only look at deep tissue at the Washington State Hospital Association. Yeah. If a patient presents with peritonitis rather than it being discovered after, uh, during surgery, um, is there a distinction there if they- Absolutely, yes. So that's another piece of, no, no. That, so how do we determine if it is one? Some of these have different criteria about how many days out. So like a hip surgery, you, you, we have to monitor those patients for 90 days. It still counts as ours, even if we had a case years and years and years ago where a patient had a, a knee replacement and decided to go wading in the Acma River afterwards, um, and they, they got infected or people go in a hot tub, or, right? And that's all, it's counted as our infection, even though there were patient factors that, you know, led to that. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Hobby. Um, So it's counted as our infection if we know about it. So my question is, is what happens if a patient develops an infection and goes to a, a subsequent hospital? Mm -hmm. And how, does that get reported back to us as we, our infection? We so we let other people know when they come to us that, hey, we found this case because they may not know about it. Um, yeah, you wouldn't know if someone went somewhere else. So we do rely uh, somewhat on others letting us know if our own patient Developed but it's infection. not mandatory to report. Though. Not as far as I know. No, um, that's kind of a. I think it's pretty standard though. It, if somebody it, shows up in the ED and they had a hip sixty days ago, and it looks like there's. It, it's pretty standard to get back to the provider and let them know. And certainly in our clinics, they report. Now, sometimes that provider may not let their hospital know though, and so. And do you want to explain why? Well, they probably don't want to count it, but. But um, so that's why when we don't rely on um, some places use physician provided reports to determine if they have any surgical site infections, right? So other, and this is what we do is we look at all kinds of other data. So, and in certain cases, you have to enter all of that data into NHSN, whether they develop an infection or not. So every single hip replacement, knee replacement, colon resection we do, or hysterectomy, um, Anna goes in and looks at that chart, and she has to enter that patient case into NHSN. And that's how you get a rate, right? You have to have the denominator, who are the total number of patients that had this procedure versus the numerator, those that got it. And then she's also looking at um, hair that's in the emergency department and in our clinics, wound culture reports. Uh, she looks at all kinds of patient data surveillance that she's doing all the time. We get incident reports, so our own employees might see, um, I, I'm a, a home health nurse and I'm taking care of this patient and I see something going on. They'll put that into our incident reporting system or they'll they'll alert us that, that they see something. Um, or our providers do, they, they let us know. Uh, we also do rounding on the floor to see if there's anything we're concerned about. Um, so lots of review of charts um, and data to try and identify these, uh, but some of it does rely on people reporting it. And that is one of the things we've wondered uh, in the past when we look at our rates compared to others, is I think we're very good at reporting on ourselves. Um, falls is another place where 
it's dependent on the institution reporting on themselves. And if people don't report it, then it doesn't get counted. And I think we we do have a culture of reporting at KVH. You can see from our incident reporting. Now this um, is a, I don't want to take you too far yeah. off track, but this is, we want these to be reported so that we can uh, figure out what went wrong and improve in the future. And that's why to try not to have this sort of blame shame sort of yes. culture and to encourage reporting uh, so that we can get better. Yep. Yeah. And we are required to report it. It's just that some people, some people don't. So Medicare requires 90 days, but other insurance is 90 days that global. Um, so on the 91st day, it wouldn't. It, that's it's not really dependent on the payer. This is for all patients. Yeah. So ninety days is the magic number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On um, hip replacements, it can be different for different surgeries. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, and then, like if you're talking about, um, it could depend on the patient's condition when they arrived and the tests we did. So if you tested a patient for C diff when they arrived and it was negative, and then later they you test and they have it, well that's easy to say. But what if you didn't test them when they came? So you have to look at the symptoms the patient had. Um, so it there's a, a lot of different factors that have to be looked at for each case. So when we're monitoring and we find, Anna finds a case that's concerning, maybe there's a, a wound culture result that she looks at and she says, ooh, that, or a return to surgery. That's often how we find them. They've got to go in and, and wash out a wound or something. Um, she'll look at the chart. She goes through all of the specifications. Um, she enters that data in. And um, and she reviews the case to try and determine is this does this meet does this count or not? Um, there's other things we do have to do like I was talking about with the um, surgeries, right? She has to enter every single one into um, NHSN. But for other things like a cauti, a catheter acquired urinary tract infection, in order to get the rate that we have of those infections, you have to count. Um, catheter days. So we have to look and see how many patients had catheters every day. So on at a given point in time and every day, how many patients had catheters? And that's your catheter days. And you enter that in for the entire month for by unit and by patient type into NHSN. So then when we have one, that gives us our rate of a, of a cotton. That's not what we have on this data point here. We just have single digits because our the numbers are they're so low. Um, so we don't look at a rate here. We look at each and every one. Let's see. Well, the information that you've been giving us, uh, we're probably going to see some of that increase in our QAPI, which is our quality assurance performance improvement. Because if you look at the, the dashboard here, there's several items here that were in the floppy uh, that have increased. And one, the suicide risk assessment intervention bundle uh, used to be uh, down below 100%. But if you look at this dashboard now, we've reached 100% on it. And that's a lot of that stuff, I, I believe, is because the floppy, which is something that uh, Medicare requires that we work on, and so uh, every year we have a coffee that we talk about at our meeting here. And, uh, that is how we can move forward with our quality improvement. Yeah, so it may be something that is looked at to be included in coffees for next year, hospital acquired infections, because uh, like I point out in my report, there's five, there's five this month, which is more. And we look at year over year you know, how we've been doing, are we improving, are we declining? Um, every single one of these uh, hospital acquired infections um, is, there's a root cause analysis done on them. And that gets reported to the surgery anesthesia committee, to QI council, to um, to the departments. And, and, and they look at where there are improvement opportunities. And do, do we need a large scale event or are we going to do real-time improvement. I, I really want to call out that work that Anna does and it, it triggers, you know, our CS department and Amy, everybody coming together and really playing detective. And they're looking at sterile technique. They're looking mm -hmm. at how CS is processing things. Anytime they see a cluster and particularly during the during this construction project, one of the things that Anna has been charged with is really watching the sterile environment while we've been under construction. 
So when we see one of these, it, it triggers this, this uh, root cause analysis that involves all those departments, the surgeons, are they wearing the right headgear? Are they, you know, maintaining sterile fields in the OR? And they go in and they observe all of that. So it is an amazing process that Anna. Has and, and then we look at, you know, what were the factors? What were the, the, the root causes? And um, is it things that we can manage, or is it patient behaviors, right, that we're not going to change? Some things like smoking or their nutrition, we might be able to influence prior to surgery. Um, other things we have less control about, like whether they go in a hot tub after surgery. Um, Opportunity for extra education. Mm -hmm. And and oh, there's so programs called like Strong for Surgery, which is- They're given a packet that says yeah. a list of, don't do this, don't do that. But there are times where we've seen, could we improve our discharge instructions about yeah. wound care? Yeah. Um, and not just looking at hospital care too, saying, um, What's happening in the clinics when we're doing suture removal? When did that infection happen? What was the organism? So what's that most associated with? So there's they're looking at all of those details to try and decide what interventions we're going to prioritize or what improvement work. So for example, um, Jeff uh, Holdman and Informatics and Anna and um, Deb Scheib with uh, education have been working on their catheter, um, their urinary catheter uh, policy and protocols because um, we did see we hadn't had cotties for years and years and years. And I think we've had two in the last uh, couple years. And so that was an area of focus and improvement. Um, another thing is looking at some of these surgical site infections. They were cases that uh, were in patients first because of some emergency, like a fall or something that happened. And they didn't get the, it's called the and it calls it the nose to toes protocol, but it's a, a, an antiseptic wash that you put on the body and a, and a nasal swab to help decontaminate the whole body. Well, we notice when a patient's an inpatient, there's just not the same process for that happening first as when they come in for planned surgery. So Jeff and the team have been working on how do we implement that on the inpatient side so those patients get it too. Uh, yeah, this is someone who falls, come in, comes in through the emergency department. So they didn't have the pre-surgical consult where they were got the nose mm -hmm. to toes instructions. So. Yeah. 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 So um what else? I think I've covered everything. The um there can be additional review of an individual provider's performance by peer review, whether that's saying Gosh, we feel like we've had more cases with this one person. That's something that's happened in the past. Um, or just, man, this case is, is weird or interesting or we're not sure. Uh, and so that can go through the medical staff peer review process to look at that individual perform, uh, uh, provider's performance. But usually we're looking at kind of the whole the whole thing. You know, what's the process uh, and system that they're in? less than the individual provider. It sounds like true detective work and it sounds fascinating. I I think Anna really enjoys it a lot. Yes, it's one of her passions. Uh, and it, yeah, it's a lot of deep um, deep digging in to see you know what they can find and all the details. And there the, yeah. aha moments? Like this is... Yeah, something yeah. Like, like trying to think of something. Well, I mean, even like that inpatient, the, the nose to toes protocol and those patients, like realizing what was the commonality between, you know, these three cases and like, oh, you know, we're not, we're not, we don't have the same process for this thing. And that's probably where it was. We have seen too a few cases with um, elevated uh, blood glucose um, intraoperatively. And so working with um, Dr. Penoyer and he's saying, you know, we can, and anesthesia, we can do, there's things we can do. Let's, let's look into this. Um, so it's, it's kind of exciting to have um, the physician leadership we have right now. And um, just, yeah, the, the teams we've got, I think they're doing really great work. Anna did review though. Part of it is looking at kind of things you may not think about too. So looking at all of our, um, construction and what was going on where with construction at the time of each of these cases and just making sure we're ruling that out too, that that wasn't uh, a correlation. And it wasn't, but, but 
got to look at all of those um all of those things years ago at a qi council uh, meeting we had I, I remember um there was a spike or something in uh, infections during total hip replacements or something. Yeah. And it was a lot, you know, they get into granular detail. Is is the provider touching their face? Are they, yeah. you know, where are they standing? How are they, what are they touching? What are they not, you know, it's uh, it's incredible the amount of uh, detail. Well, things like looking at, yeah, or is it hair covered? Does somebody, is somebody wearing fake eyelashes now? I mean, that's a whole big thing in the world of infection control is what, what are we doing with fake eyelashes? Um, I remember there was a time we had our sterile supplies stored in this, um, room where we realized there was an external door to it. And, you know, we didn't find any like contaminants or anything that matched, but swabbing things in there. And, um, that was part of when we, we ended up moving some of those, um, supplies, those sterile supplies. Um, I, there was a time even EVS was looking at it, do we need to clean inside some of the vents? Like, um, we've had people observe surgeries and they were like, Okay, the knee is falling below the the level of the table. So is that having something to do with it? So it really is a lot of um, detective work and and you know trying to keep an open mind about uh, yeah not not blame and shame right. We're, we don't want to point fingers or say that any one person is doing something wrong. But is there something we can find that will make a difference? Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> All with an eye toward uh, improving uh, patient safety and health outcomes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any uh, other questions for Mandy about this, about uh, the report on hospital inquiry? We, have we picked another one? Mm -hmm. I think we have one for next month. Yes. Uh, home health and home health referrals, I think, and hospice. Just saw it in the in the minutes. I thought we had, I think, yeah. last August, August, uh, September. August and September. One bout of excitement. I don't remember. Yeah, it was. Um, it's home uh, timely start for home health at the August meeting, and um, sepsis is in September, which uh, is sep uh, sepsis awareness month too. So, okay. Excited about that. I did that on purpose. I know. Something. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I remember. Uh, I mean, I've, I I did uh, restraints, and then I forget which which one of you did that, but. Uh, John, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to to say something or Terry. So uh, anyway, start thinking about what you would like uh, Mandy to to talk about, and we'll be sure to get that on the agenda uh, in a future meeting. Well, I think the suggestion that you just said is, is really important because it is going to show the future of our quality improvement. Okay. Yeah, I mean uh, these are really uh, important topics. So that's good. Thank All you right. So much, yeah. Thanks. This is uh, this was a good idea. And I'm glad we're doing this uh, every day. I don't feel like clapping for you because you report so well. <laughs> Not any, me. Uh, any last questions for Mandy before we move on? Anything else for us? Well, Terry pointed out the suicide risk assessment intervention bundle did reach 100% for the first right. time. And that's really awesome. So I, I think it's worth calling out. So should call that awesome things. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? That's good. Thank you very much, man. We appreciate it. Uh, next up, then, we have our CEO, Julie Peterson. Julie. Yeah, my report is on page 16. It was a quiet few weeks. Um, I don't have much to add, except um, Hospital District 2 did have two applicants for their vacant commissioner position. Both of them, coincidentally, were providers at employees of Hospital District 1. Providers at Family Medicine, Yellow, Sarah Hinnages, and Oren O'Connell, uh, both interviewed. And uh, Oren, I believe, will the, the interview committee will be bringing forth Oren as their proposed replacement commissioner for her big. So, and I believe Sarah also voted for Oren. So, everyone <laughs> all around was pretty happy with it. So, I'm looking forward to working with him. And he and his family live up. Uh, in the Easton area, and we don't have a commissioner representative from that area, so that'll be nice. All right. I would remind you we have a strategic planning and quality refresh on Saturday morning out in the canyon at, I believe it starts at nine o'clock. Do I have that right? Yep. And if we're chased out by fires, we will start making phone calls and relocate the meeting to this room. Okay. 
and you will get an opportunity to meet Janine Redding, our new Chief Human Resource Officer at that meeting. Yep. And Dr. Hoppy, are you going to be able to make it? Yes. Great. So we have Dr. Hoppy, we have Dr. Stone, Trisha will be joining us in addition to this group. Okay. Um, any questions for uh, Julie about uh, her report? All right, then we have uh, Jen Strader filling in uh, this uh, this month. Thank you for filling in on HR. And uh, we have the HR and staff development report, Jennifer Strader. Um, anything you'd like to call our attention to? Yeah, so as a matter of fact, and Julie didn't fulfill what she promised. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you're fine. So I do have new data to report. So um, in preparing for this meeting, I went to our turnover spreadsheet and started kind of slicing and dicing and discovered that our HR division assistant was given not clear instructions on how to report our turnover. So this is why we work with people and not with numbers. We are, <laughs> we are not mathematicians. So Huh. The good news is all the numbers are better. They are better. Yes. So on the plus side of things, and we'll fix this for the next board report, but actually our year-to-date turnover in people is not 100. It's 54. So our turnover percentage is not 12.8. It's 6.8. And our voluntary turnover, not 95, was 46 and involuntary uh, instead of five was actually eight. So that's great. Our turnover last year, year end was 24.7%. So if we keep on the same trajectory, we're looking at a 12 or 13% year end turnover, which is half. So that's been amazing. He said he has information on the the reasons people leave. Yep. So um, for specifically year to date, um, we had five people who were never able to return from a leave. So they left for a medical leave for some purpose and were not able to return back to work and we had to separate employment. Six people moved out of the area. That's very common in a lot of our front desk positions, being a college town, people will come here, work for a couple years, and then head home. We did have three people so far this year that quit without notice. So um, either no calling, no show, or walking away in the middle of the day. And then also three retirements so far this year. So voluntary resignations, you know, being 46, but at least nine of those were because they moved out of the area or they retired. So and we are getting a lot better at tracking our exit interview data. That was a real big push for us in 2024 was to reach out to everybody who turns a notice and ask them for a one-on-one -on -one exit interview meeting. And if they decline that, we send them a packet, a form to complete. That was really all I have. Is so Any questions? Goodness. For uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I attended the, uh, the health experience health care the other day with uh, with a bunch of high school students who were really interested in, and uh, it's a lot of work. I appreciate again you get you helping me uh, put together some numbers. Absolutely. for that but anyway that was that was a really good experience I, it was good to see you there yes. thank, thank you for doing that you student, yeah. there were 15 13 students yeah. and that includes kiddos ellensburg and thorpe thorpe and I, I don't remember there was a, even a homeschool student who had applied as well so. they were really um they were really excited about some of the prospects of uh sort of uh, our, our training and educational um, opportunities that we have here, like the MA apprenticeship program, things like that. A really good success story. We have an employee, Becky Cortese. Her daughter went through Experience Healthcare, absolutely loved it, and is now going through one of our apprenticeship programs. Mm -hmm. So That's she, right. that good full circle moment with that. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Any other uh, questions for Jeff? Thanks for uh, coming and thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, next up, then we have the expansion project update with Wayne Tibbetts. Dick Wayne, all yours. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of how our month was, uh, we started off very slow on the expansion part of it uh, when we were starting into uh, phases uh, uh, 2FPB. We came across uh, some unforeseen issues, uh, uh, structure that we didn't realize that was actually there, and we had to figure out a way to move around it. Uh, but with the coordination that we had with our contractors and with our architects and even the coordination that we had within the building um, with people in the clinical side as far as surgery and recovery, um, it really turned out well. We had a, an extremely busy week this last week, um, but we kept pushing um we there was a fear that we were going to have to delay a couple of things by about a week and we kept pushing and pushing and we uh, me and the contractors we made some promises and we kept those promises and you know we we finished out uh strong um today we actually had the uh Ellensburg, um city inspector and fire marshal here and we've gotten our temporary uh, uh, occupancy certificate for OR4 and in the uh, central sterile. So um, right now, as it is going, we, we are still completing some work. We have uh, some machinery, some equipment that we are moving from the old uh, central sterile and putting it into the new central sterile and we're doing some exchange and some equipment for uh, the surgery rooms as well. And everything is working great on that. Um, we had a chance where there might be a, uh, some power changes that we aren't happy with electrical and everything is coming up great on that. So we're moving along very fast. I'm very happy that we didn't have to push anything out. Uh, we caught up to it and now we are uh, moving into another phase of 2C. Uh, we are leaving uh, 2A, which was OR4, where uh, we were able to complete everything out. Uh, we just have a little bit of trimming uh, and finalization to do in there. Uh, we do have, uh, we are going to have to wait on a, a vendor to deliver some equipment. Um, that won't be here or installed until closer into September. Um, we're watching that and making sure that uh, we're following up with that and we're going to try and see if we can even bring it in sooner if possible. Um, so from there, we're going, uh, we're finalizing the rough end for our recovery room, which means anything that's behind the sheetrock is going in right now. Um, we're hoping to finalize uh, the rough end on uh, at the end of next week and be ready for uh, you know new sheetrock, doing the paint, doing the trimming, and hopefully in about two weeks we will be back into recovery. Uh, from there, we are actually starting. Um, on the 1st of August, sorry, the 2nd of August, we're starting to where we're going to move into another section of materials management and start uh, moving ourselves back across into the other three ORs so we can start preparing for them. Um, we're starting in the uh, current CS or uh, central sterile where we will be renovating that area and making it a more uh, convenient location for a central sterile for endo and uh, Cisco rooms. So uh, we should be moving into that, like I say, next week, probably looking at about a month's work and, uh, and that have that complete and ready to go. So 
it's been a very it's been a very good week. It's been very busy, but we've uh, we ended up where we didn't lose any days. It's been good. Okay. Questions, comments for Wayne. Thank you very much, Wayne. Anything else, Julie, before we move on to operations? No, sir. All right. And then uh, we'll move on to operations and start with our CNO, Didi Outlay Didi. Good evening. Uh, my report starts on page 19, and I'm, it's a little longer than usual, but we have lots of good stuff happening. Um, I do want to call out that we um, have our dialysis program up and running, and I think both Dr. Martin and myself reported, or you, you got your report in after me. We we have um, had a patient, and it is it went uh, well. Um, the kidney committee has been meeting, and we have today finished approving all of our policies and procedures. So a big shout out to Jeff Holdeman and Wayne Foley for getting those. Um, we've, I think that's going to really turn into a engaging meeting. Um, I listened in today, and just a lot of great dialogue. Uh, we've had education um, come on site. And we're looking at doing some more education with staff just around dialysis and that patient population in general. Uh, Didi, just for the maybe for the benefit of our of our guests here from the League of Voters, would you say something about inpatient dialysis? This is something we just so, started. Like what is inpatient dialysis and, and what does it mean for the so so um as you know, dialysis is a very special procedure that you can't find everywhere. Um, we do have DaVita here in our town that does outpatient dialysis, but if we had patients that we needed to admit here, we would not be able to admit them. And that could be somebody with, a, you know, a, I say a simple hip fracture or, or pneumonia that we could easily take care of. But if they have dialysis, then we do have to transfer them. And dialysis beds are very few and far between um, across the hospital. And there are times we've had to hold them here for quite some time even send them over to DaVita to get their dialysis, but then they come back to our ER while we're waiting for that bed. Um, KVH, gosh, it's, I don't know how long it's been, it was on, online. Um, we started talking about this over a year ago, two years ago? Six years ago. So, okay, six <laughs> years ago. <laughs> but, but that was, the, you know, and then some things happened, um, you know, that so it got put down uh, further on our list. But um, probably for this last good year, we've we've been working with, um, bringing on the equipment, the staff, the processes. I mean, it's just been a very large process. And the beginning of July, we were able to officially flip the switch and say, we are open for business. Um, the other nice thing is we, we do the telehealth with the nephrologists, and we can also just do simple consults with them. So we've done uh, many consults. So it's not that every patient has to have dialysis, um, you know, and the nice thing that was brought up in a meeting this week was we're even keeping patients that we might not have kept because we have that nephrology consult and the ability to do dials, which doesn't mean we've necessarily well. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a great program and we're able to keep our patients here locally. Um, most people that uh, have dialysis just they know to not come to our hospital if they are going to be admitted knowing we don't have it, so they would bypass us. So we're looking forward to getting that word out into the community that please, you know, come to our hospital. And and there still may be some patients that we're not going to keep here, but they will need that higher level of care. But um, yeah, we started offering so many new services um, in the last you know eight years or so, and uh, I just I think it's good to kind of emphasize and celebrate because uh, it's it's a long process to get it up and running. You know? yeah. it's, um, but yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Can I, I just like to, the reason this service grows and got our attention was because it was one of the primary reasons we were transferring patients out of the emergency department. So we, month after month, saw a high number of transfers associated with dialysis. So these are, you know, there's a constant pool of patients who are on dialysis in the community and they're fragile. They're susceptible to the infections and things like that. So as Dee Dee said, um, they would either come here and be transferred or they knew that we didn't have that service so they would bypass us. That means a fragile patient and their families traveling 70 miles for a service that, they, that we 
hopefully we'll start providing more and more. And while we've dialogued one patient, I really want to emphasize one of the things Dee Dee said, which is we've kept other patients knowing they, they were discharged before they needed dialysis or they didn't need dialysis. But previously, we wouldn't have put them in an inpatient bed or admitted them because we couldn't provide that service should they need it. So again, it's just one of those great things where you can serve people here and the inconvenience to families when you have to go to Seattle or go to Wenatchee or Yakima is avoided. They're kept in the community and they can see their family and loved ones. Well, Inconvenience, and as you said, they are uh, oftentimes very fragile patients, and so it introduces risk if they have to drive, you know, drive or, or be transported 70, 70 miles or so. Um, all right, sorry, I didn't mean to. to... Oh, and uh, one thing I think Trisha may have put some in the in the chat is she said it's been three years. So oh, okay. just a little bit of discrepancy. Yeah, I didn't think I was. Trisha's been here three years. Yeah. Uh, there was okay. she got me. All right, good to know. Um, all right, uh, sorry, did you go ahead? No, that's okay. Um, I think just the other highlight is that I do have an interim family birthplace um, nursing director who will be transitioning. Um, we're going to let Stacy go to her new position in informatics. Um, that'll be uh, mid-August. And it is actually Amy Morse, who is um, my clinical educator, who's been uh, doing our NAC program. So we're gonna let her finish the second cohort, which did start. And we have nine nursing assistant students. So we're gonna let her finish out this cohort and then she'll spend a little time with Stacy and kind of try the job out, see what she thinks. And we'll see what the next steps are there. Right. I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Questions for Dee. Okay. All right. Next up, we have uh, Rhonda Holden, our Chief Ancillary Officer. Rhonda. Hi, everyone. My report is on page 22, and I have just a few updates. Um, as soon as I submitted my report, we did uh, receive notice from the Joint Commission that they had accepted our evidence of standard uh, completion. So we were very excited about that, that we didn't have any yeah. additional work to do. So congratulations to Katie for putting together such an excellent document. My other update would be under rehab services. In addition to hiring um, a speech and language pathologist, they have been able to hire a permanent occupational therapist. So that's very exciting to see the staff grow there. And then my other announcement, we learned this week, uh, Cleum Pharmacy in Cleum uh, closed with virtually little notice to the public or anyone else. And actually yesterday was their last day of service. They are currently transferring all of the patient prescriptions to Safeway and Cleolum. Um, so that's caused just a little bit of a ruckus up here um, because in the past, the patients haven't been really happy with that pharmacy. Um, so we're anticipating that our providers might be hearing a lot of concerns and complaints, just like happened last time. We had closures of uh, our local pharmacies here, and we're trying to determine, you know, what what can we do to support maybe another pharmacy coming in as well. So more on that next month. Uh, Rhonda, who did you say um, spearheaded the evidence of standards uh, compliance in the Joint Commission? Uh, the lab director, Katie Bellotti. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, it's good that that was accepted. That's a that's a big deal, and I'm glad that it, it was uh, such a good, uh, I mean, such a good uh, report back to them. So yes, thank please you. Please pass along our thanks for them. Definitely, I will. Any uh, questions, comments for Ron? So, if we only have one pharmacy up a county, is there any way? With a 340B here, can there be an arm of 340B in Cleo? We pulled a team together that actually met for the first time today. And if you'll recall, as Rhonda mentioned, we went through a similar yeah. fire drill up in Upper County a few years ago. So we refreshed the pro forma from that to start looking at what solutions might look like. And we do have a, a brief update in executive session as well around the business. Okay. Ron is correct. Upper County people, they 
yeah. really frustrating with safety. So, so it was nice to have the work that had been done a few years ago to yeah. refer to. Any other questions, comments for Rhonda? Thanks a lot, Rhonda. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Stacy Olay, our Chief of Clinic Operations. Stacy. Yes, my report starts on page 23. And last month, you guys asked for some information on our medical assistance apprenticeship program. So I just want to highlight some things in there. Um, key takeaways, 40% of our medical assistant staff have either completed the program or are currently in the program. This has been our saving grace to get MAs working in the clinic. Um, there was a time before 2020 where we weren't doing a lot of apprenticeships and we actually had to do temporary labor and bring temp MAs in to get us through the last three quarters of 2022. Um, I'm happy to say the program is extremely successful. We are seeing about a 22%, 25% leave the program, but some of it is people are moving out People get into the program and then go, oh, this is not really what I want to be doing. And then we have quite a few that go into nursing school or go into physical therapy or go into somewhere else in the medical field who don't want to stay on per diem because they don't want to try to balance that per diem requirement with their school life. The other really good thing about the program is we have 27 medical assistants who act as preceptors. So this program requires a one-to-one -one ratio from day one of the program until they are certified by the state. So our existing staff, we have criteria and special training for them. They have to precept all of these students. So just an incredible program that if we didn't have, we would really be struggling with staff. And I am open to any questions. Questions for Stacey. Thank you very much, Stacey. You're welcome. So while while they're in the program, are they just registered the MAs? They're not even registered MAs. They're recognized as an MA apprentice. So they come in a, even a lower salary than a registered MA. Okay. But they work those first three months hand in hand with their preceptor. And at nine months into the program, they can actually work independently. So they don't need a preceptor right by them as they're rooming patients, as they're taking vitals. And then they can continue that MA apprenticeship. Um, we had a few that struggled to sign up to take the test for certification. So what we now have is once you complete the program, you have 90 days to get your certification test completed. I do want to thank the board again for supporting the decision to make all three of our apprenticeship programs, our pharmacy tech program, MA program, and then the CNA program as well, paid positions. This really allows people who, I, I, you know, people need a paycheck and it opens these opportunities up to a whole different people in our community and starts them, as Stacey said, on the sort of track to becoming a nurse or in one case at APC. Mm -hmm. So, um, but being able to pay them while they go through these programs has really helped get an outstanding group of students in all three of them. Well, there's all this, uh, I mean, there's all this data out there that where people do their training, they end up, they usually end up staying there, you know, just sort of statistically. So the more people we can kind of develop from in the community, the more likely we are to have people who stick around and work for many years for us. And uh, yeah, the board's always been very supportive of of uh, developing talent within the within the community and within the organization itself. So it's uh, thank you, uh, Julie, for uh, calling that out. Any other questions for Stacy? Thanks, Stacy. Uh, then we move on to uh, medical staff, and we start with our chief of staff, uh, Dr. Roberta Huff. Dr. Huff. Yeah, my uh, one page report is on 26. Um, this month, uh, the Medical Executive Council, we reviewed a uh, total of 12 appointments. Three were initial appointments, and the rest were reappointments. Um, I'm happy to 
answer any questions. Everybody here has had a chance to review those online? Yes. Okay. Any questions for Dr. Hoppe about these? Hearing none, then do I have a motion to approve the uh, recommendations for appointment and reappointment as submitted to, to us by MEC? Move to approve. Second. Okay, motion from Erica, second from Bob. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the uh, recommendations for appointment and reappointment as submitted to us by MEC, uh, please say aye. 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 Uh, there you have it. Um, Dr. Hoppe, anything else? No. Thanks for all the work you guys are doing in MEC. I know that uh, John and I uh, really appreciate uh, how well run that committee is and how you guys have really been uh, you know, dealing with, with all sorts of different things, including reviewing these, but uh, but tackling the bylaws, various other things. I uh, uh, really appreciate the thoughtful discussion and just hearing the process, working through various issues. It's really fascinating. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hoppe. Uh, next up, we move on to our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Kevin Martin, and uh, there he uh, included a, a sheet for us uh, because his report wasn't in there. He was he's been sidelined recently, um, uh, but there is a, a report that was submitted separately for us. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Very briefly, um, we have five providers that are inbound uh, that will start over the next several months. Uh, we have three others that we're working with to get under contract. We have a total of 23 provider postings, which um, is a daunting number. Uh, you've already seen the output from medical staff. Um, again, uh, actually, I'm going to circle back to that. Um, I've been out of commission for most of the last three weeks, so uh, CMO activities were largely recuperative. Um, I want to come back to the dialysis. Um, dialysis was actually one of the things that I first started working on when I became CMO. And we worked with Northwest uh, Kidney Centers and DaVita, and largely it consisted of making a lot of phone calls and sending emails that went unanswered. And um, none of the people currently on my team were on my team when I started that. It wasn't until Trish identified a viable partner for us that we started gaining some traction. And I can't say enough about the work that's gone into developing the infrastructure, uh, reworking a couple of CCU rooms so that we could perform dialysis in there, the training that our nursing staff has gotten to be able to do that procedure. Um, it's been a real snowball the last couple, three years, but boy, it was a slog when we started. I'll take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Martin? Can I just point out with Dr. Swain, we did have a LNT practice in family medicine in Ellensburg previously, and that provider left. So they, she is going to be there strictly to do LNT. Right. That and it it's offers us um, a powerful, powerful modality for addressing uh, pain and chronic pain without resorting to controlled substances. And uh, the reason that we looked for someone to do that was because of the success that we had and the feedback that we got. Any other questions for Dr. Martin? Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, then we'll move on from our medical staff to uh, finance and our chief financial officer, Jason Adler. Jason. Thank you. <laughs> Well, June volumes started off pretty slow, but by the end of the month, it had really picked up to where we actually came up and exceeded budget on our total charges for the year um, by $672,000, so pretty significantly. Uh, clinic visits still continue to be below budget as we have throughout the year, but we are less full of budget than we have year to date. So we are continuing to see more and more visits there, but still holding a little bit below. Um, June had strong surgery volumes compared to the year to date average, and admissions were below budget, but ER visits exceeded by 5.2%. So ER was, was really busy in May, and it was really busy in June as well. Um, with the recent recruiting ses successes from providers, there's only locum providers in women's health. So not too long ago, we had locums in most of our clinics, and 
pediatrics, internal adult medicine, um, the, the GMP primary care. Um, so it's nice to see those recruiting success paying off there with some permanent staff. Supplies and materials management team has been really working with all the vendors and all of our supplies to to save where we can. So we're coming in below budget by eight or nearly four thousand for the year to date on total supplies. Um, so with strong revenue um, expenses and good investment returns, we ended with two hundred forty six thousand dollars positive operating income and 741,000 net income. So there was a really strong return on our investments this month of almost a half a million. Uh, I'm working with Hyper Sandler Company to do an RFP for the $10 million tax, ex tax exempt bond and an option in that that the banks can respond to for a $5 million standing line of credit. I'll have two resolutions coming for the board over the coming months for those. And one will be today, and then one will be potentially next month for that debt. Any questions on my write up portion? Any questions uh, before we go to this more specifics? On just page 30, I just wanted to note the Surgery volumes there. So surgical minutes were 7% above budget for the month compared to just under budget 1.4% year to date. And then procedures were 4% over budget and year to date is just slightly under budget at 0.2%. So June had a really good surgery month. Um, and then you see the total clinic visits there it's still 4.5% under budget compared to 5.8% under budget year to date. So still a moving in the right direction there. And any questions on the stats pages? <coughs> and page 32, the charts I think worth looking at. So you can see we've we've really dug out of, we were running an operating loss there since October and I've slowly been pulling out of that and, and above the black line the last couple of months, so hope to see that hold forever <laughs> <laughs> in the future. You want to make a public I think, again, with the expansion, we anticipated um, so much is driven by procedures and, and surgery, so we did anticipate that we would have losses for a while, but at the same time, the commitment to our OB program has really bad at the end of the statement. And as Jason mentioned, we've got permanent hires from OBHG. We've also been able to staff in. And we also made the investment in additional anesthesia services as OB, or excuse me, as surgery gets better, we're keeping that broader base of anesthesia providers much busier. This is something that uh, when Terry and I were at the, the WISH meeting recently, uh, rural hospitals who they basically have to make a decision whether to get rid of OB or whether to to sort of do it at a loss, serve the community. Um, there is no rural hospital that's just going gangbusters in terms of income on OB service. Um, we just yeah, are. I mean, so we, anyway, we appreciate the the fact that we can uh, support that kind of um, kind of program because you know it's part of the theme about keeping care local and supporting the community. So anyway. We appreciate your ability to keep us in the black, even though that particular service um, is, is a sort of dream. We, were, we did lose OB services from another rural hospital, it was Cascade, was it? In Cascade Valley by Cascade. Schedule. Yeah, yeah. Schedule. Yeah. 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 yeah, really unfortunate to see those closing at our rural communities. Um, cash investments, so the day's cash online there, can see was falling pretty quick and that was anticipated as as we went through a really high spending time in the expansion project so that's the time when we're purchasing the cts the mri and all that major major infrastructure out there when there was no parking because we had so many construction crews doing all various aspects on the building uh, you're talking about days cash on me yeah so one of the things to note about sorry you know, yeah. oh go ahead um, one of the things to note about that is the 
the, the way that the numbers are set up, it's a little misleading. And by misleading, I mean, when it's gone down from, you know, 200, you know, 211 or whatever, a day's cash on, on hand to 140 something. And if you, if you look at other rural hospitals, like they would kill for 140. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's so even though it sort of looks like it's going down, if you, if, if you compare us to comparable hospitals, we're, we're actually 140 is sort of a, a dream for a lot of these people. I know a lot of these, uh, a lot of these places, I mean, you probably have better sense of the doing probably has a better sense of sort of where other rural hospitals are when they, we talk about days cash on hand, but I mean, it can be like in the low double digits, you know? Um, so even though it looks like a, a big decline, it's the decline is to a number that is still very strong. It's also a little bit misleading too on the decline because a lot of that cash that had it so high was our fifteen million in debt that we took right. to spend this. So we spent the, the expectation project. was that this would be an influx of money so that we could spend it, and right. so this is artificially inflated at the beginning. Yeah, and we have so much to show for it because yeah. that tour down there is just phenomenal. It's great. Yeah. All right, Jason. Sorry. Um, and then on just the income statement, I just wanted to highlight the supplies line item there. So supplies are, even though revenue, total services above budget for the month, supplies are below budget and, um, and below budget 804,000 year to date. And then if you even look, the prior year to date was 8.2 million in total spending and supplies. And we're coming in at 6.6 .6 million total spend on supplies year to date this year. So just shout out to our supplies buyers and we are the only ones in the organization that like our buyers now they're everybody else yeah. is mad at them. <laughs> uh jason going back to the payer mix and medicare advantage how that's exponentially grown and yeah so medicare advantage is not a great product and we've seen it really inflate in kitas county over the last few years um we're kind of uh, lagging behind the rest of the nation in that growth. So the, the rest of the developed areas are going to see a 40 to 50 percent mm -hmm. advantage in their payer. Is there any, anything we can do to really educate people of pros and the cons? Yep. See? So we've been talking and, and we're going to work with Michelle on an information campaign. Yeah. Uh, they get a one sided because it's on TV. Yeah. Right. We had some good success recently. We sent out letters to all the patients that we knew were who were on Medicare Advantage plans that we do not have any contract or affiliation with. So we were able to get those people to at least choose a Medicare Advantage plan for a Medicare plan that we do contract with. Yeah, there's no network adequacy requirements for Medicare Advantage. You can sell someone a product and not have a provider for a hundred miles. And I think we've all heard that wow. easy. Yeah, you you have to take a ferry ride to see a physician if you live on Hood the Kudai. And this very story was told to members of Congress in April when we when uh <laughs> when uh representatives from different hospital districts in Washington State, but also elsewhere, are sort of giving uh, uh members of Congress an earful about uh, mm -hmm. about Medicare Advantage and uh I think they heard us. So I think uh, I think so. We're working at that level. Some people are working at that level. And wishes working at that level to try to to sort of push things a little. Yeah, we're also struggling with uh, disposition, so discharging patients to you know skilled nursing facilities. Yeah. So that's another area that they don't have contracts, and so we can't get them in the hospital. Yeah. So where we hold patients then that yeah. and then they don't clean us because they don't meet the acute care criteria. Do you have any follow-up to the question? No, just I mean when they go back, if they switch get off Medicare Advantage, go back to like I guess secondary insurance, they they're judged against their previous existing conditions and yeah. they're paying more. Mm -hmm. Right. And they don't know that. Yeah. Right. It's not it's not just uh, switching back without any any sort of penalty. Yeah. yeah. There's only those open windows. They can do that. Yeah. It's tough because Medicare, obviously CMS doesn't market, hey, buy our Medicare product, but Medicare Advantage, those health insurers really market their product. 
Yeah, they have really strong marketing campaigns. They um, pay large placement fees to the um, insurer, bro insurance brokers. Uh, so they're doing everything they can to grasp their accounts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Questions? Uh, skip over to the capital requests. So we have one capital request that was recommended to the board by the capital committee, and this is for med surgeon ICU for a complete replacement of all 19 hospital beds. We currently have Hill Rom hospital beds. They were designed, I think it was 19 years ago, the model that we're using. Mm -hmm. um, we purchased them between 2005 and 2012. They are they're all at their end of life. They are continuously being uh, repaired by our IT by our well, IT staff and our engineering staff for failing. Um, examples of what's going on with some of those is the they're malfunctioning. Their computer boards are malfunctioning. They'll just decide to lay back on their own. So the patients are obviously unhappy with that and can be some patient care issues with those. Um, for this process, we did have three vendors come in and and have a road show so that anybody could come and lay on these beds and see them. And then we had everybody that did that could take a voting card and add their notes. And Hillrom was the one that all staff um, requested. They they all liked the best. Um, and I'll let DD talk a little bit more oh, too. I think you said everything I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I think what um, I really appreciate is we not only had the beds in the departments for a couple of weeks, each individually, but then we did that the show up here with all three side by side. And it wasn't just the clinical staff. It was the housekeeping. It was finance, um, the engineering uh, department, you know, because when they break, that's who we call. And it, it so it was a really across the board uh, input on the beds. And I just want to say, since they last designed the beds that we purchased, there are so many features to reduce wear and tear on your staff. It helps with it assisting patients to stand, to turn patients, all those things that we see repetitive motion can really cause damage to our staff. So a lot of features that are staff friendly have been built into these. How much is the, uh, Mandy, how much is your office involved in, in sort of stuff like this? Like, because uh, I see patient safety is, is is said to be improved with these beds do you guys uh, get in there and say yeah these old ones are causing problems x y and z or is it mostly that they break down and we sort of hear from we have from yeah, there's not very many incident reports necessarily based on um the beds okay yeah you know, and once something is identified it's taken out of service mm -hmm. Any uh, questions about, and you guys covered this. In the yeah, but I'm, I, you know, I want to thank Bonnie and her team because I think we had a pretty good place to start, but she was able to grind them down another 30,000, <laughs> so if I understood correctly. And I always appreciate that. The so, salesman you know, don't like that. <laughs> and I also do want to call out Jeff again, yeah. because he, this has been his baby for quite a while, and he's he knows it inside and out, and I, I heard he did a great presentation. Yeah. Finance yeah, he did one. Well, I had one Thank amendment you. to it on the budget mark. Jeff did have a budget of six hundred and twenty thousand dollars in there, and I I accused him of not having this on the capital budget, but I later found it. Oops. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, Bob or John, any any last uh, thoughts or anything we need to know before we? No, I think it's good timing and yeah, good value. Yeah, right. a lot of benefits will come from this. So. Uh, I would move to approve. We have a motion from Jonathan. A second from Bob. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the capital expenditure requests, the hospital beds uh, for bed surge CCU and ICU CCU, please say aye. 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 Thank you. And we have this uh, resolution. Anything that you want to talk about before we get to the resolution? No. Okay. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind just putting this in context a little bit for, for us. Uh... Yeah, so this is a resolution related to the $10 million in, in tax exempt bonds that we have a RFP that went out on Monday to various banking institutions to respond to. And this resolution allows us 
if we decide to execute on that debt, so we have the we don't have to take it yet. Um, but if we do accept a a new debt proceeds, then we'll be able to reimburse our current capital expenditures with proceeds from the future debt borrowing. So that will help us to where any incurred expenses from today forward, we can use those funds for this project. Okay. So even if we incur the debt, mm -hmm. it starts counting. Yeah. Sure. And what that helps us do is spend it down faster so that we avoid arbitration. So we can't earn more money on investments returns than he's making too much money these days with our extra yeah. money. So he's still made careful to so we demonstrate that we spend it down on the project as quickly as possible. We're not committed, right? Okay. We're just wait saying we're we're open to receive bids. If, if we do do the debt, we can backdate it till today. Exactly. Yeah. So the next resolution will be to commit and accept a financer. Mm -hmm. And does this resolution have a certain time frame? Uh, no. Okay. Like if we didn't get the debt for six months, would this still be a valid document? I think it's 60 days. Yeah, six, well, there's this. Or no. I don't think so. That's the expenditures. No. Well, so this could go on if we decide yeah. to wait to a few more months to see what yeah. the feds are going to do or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you looking for a motion for this? Well, I, are there any other? Yeah, I say, are there any other questions about uh, about this before we uh, entertain a motion? To understand what's going on. Any questions for Jason? All right, then. Uh, do we have a motion to approve resolution twenty four dash oh four? I'll move to approve that. Okay, Terry makes a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Erica, Erica seconds. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, uh, resolution uh, 24-04, uh, reverse capital from proceeds of future borrowing, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. And that'll come back again before four weeks. Actually, yeah. Because they're going out to bids. We'll get those bids back, yeah. take a look, and decide if it's yeah. smart to move forward. Yep. Yeah. So finance sustainability team will talk and discuss the options so that the banks can respond to the RFP. They have some variables, and then we'll discuss what we think would be best for the organization, and then that would be recommended to the board. Thank you. You have the original question. Yep. Uh, anything else, uh, Jason, before we move on? That's all I have. Any other questions for Jason? Actually, one quick update on the general surgery ortho project. So that did go out to bid. We received three bids back. And the apparent low bidder was Aldrich and Associates, formerly known as VK Powell. And that bid did come in substantially lower than KDA had projected. And so we'll revisit that in the future. Yeah, they, we, so we're going through the vetting process to make sure that the apparent low bidder met all the qualifications. So we anticipate bringing that back to the audience board meeting to ask. Great having to, multiple bids. Yeah, it really was. Anything else for Jason? Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Then we'll move on to our community relations report from Michelle Wuerl, our chief public relations officer. Michelle. Hey, guys. I got to say this is really, now that we've got our huddle kind of up and running that we put out every month, um, it's really difficult to consolidate all the great work that comes out of these board reports and listening to the meeting into a two-page document for our staff. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, the updates that I wanted to give you on the board report, uh, we have, I'm happy to announce, we have hired a new communication specialist that focuses on outreach. Um, her name is Caitlin, and she's actually going to be coming to us from Family Medicine Cleellum. She um, has been a fabulous PSR up there, and in her spare time, she's been volunteering for a lot of our events. So her familiarity, both with KBH um, and a lot of what we're doing will be very helpful. She will start with us on August 12th. So I will put on the record, I apologize to Stephanie and the team up there for stealing her away. 
Um, I also wanted to let you know, if you recall a while back, we had to turn off Google Analytics um, due to some uh, requirements on or concerns on HIPAA. The American Hospital Association filed a lawsuit against that. And at this time, um, that requirement has been stayed by the courts or overruled by the courts. So we were able to turn that back on July 1st. Um, that's important, for example, as we're looking at how we're promoting our ortho department and doing Google ads and improving our search engine optimization, we can really measure the impact of that. So that's just one of the reasons why we really need that. And we were excited about that. Um, and then just a couple of other things. Um, Crystal on my team has a much better eye for art and decor than I could even imagine. And she's really taken the lead as we're doing some of these expansion projects and remodels and revamps on um, connecting with artists and bringing things in. One of the big projects that was just completed was up in Family Medicine um, Clealum. A couple of years ago, a crate showed up on our loading dock that had an old surgical lamp um, from the Clealum Hospital back dating into the 1930s. A family had donated that back. Crystal and Stephanie worked together and um, Crystal went through the archives at CWU and was able to pull out a lot of historical pictures from Cleelum and put together a display in the lobby as well as hung that surgical light with the help of engineering. And they did this yesterday and the amount of comments that they were just receiving yesterday while it was being done from the staff and public, how much they appreciated this history bring, bringing, being brought back to the clinic and how nice it looked. Um, it was just really a heartwarming experience. And she's got a really great story coming out. Um, watch social media, watch the blogs. So that was really exciting. Um, and then she's also, one of the things that we've been tackling, we call it sign fatigue. And as you know, like if you go to any registration desk, there are signs everywhere because of everything that's required from Washington State or CMS or whomever. And so we've been working to figure out a way that we can make that cleaner for our patients and what it looks like. And tomorrow we'll be installing um, two new boards that follow the decor like we have on our posters when you walk down the main hallway that talk about events or the foundation or values. We'll have um, two of these boards. One will be when you walk into the emergency room entrance and one will be as you walk through the KVH hospital vestibule. And what those will be, will be all of those required notices that we have to have will be in one place. The emergency room boards will have an English and a Spanish. And in the vestibule, it will have English then referring people just around the corner for Spanish. And then we'll be able to work with engineering to take all those other ones down, patch and paint. Um, legible and it'll always uh, get updated by the state and new requirements. So we have some flexibility, uh, but it also will unclutter things. So those are just some of the things that are going on in my area and I'd be happy to take any questions. It's gonna be uh, sad to see Alicia leave. She, she is like, already gone and out of the state. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, Friday, uh, July 19th. It was, yeah. it was uh, I mean, I expect, all these events that we go to, I just expect to see her there. Yeah, she will definitely be missed. Um, but I, we, we're definitely excited to have Caitlin. Alicia and Caitlin work really closely together. So um, I, I think you'll be excited to meet her. All right. She's uh, she's also one of our MAs who went through the apprenticeship program. So Alicia started as a scribe, went into the apprenticeship program, worked in ortho, and then got the degree and worked in marketing. Yeah. A really good system. Um, yeah, the only thing I'll mention is uh, before our next meeting, um, August twenty first is the is the barbecue uh, rodeo barbecue and community picnic. Uh, so just be sure to put that on your calendar. Thanks, Matt. Um, any questions for Michelle? All right, thank you, Michelle. That's good. All right, uh, I'll keep the, the the rest of this quick so we can get you guys is out of here rather than you know, sort of stopping it now. Uh, hope that's okay. Um, so education board reports and in, in, uh, toward the end of June, just before our last meeting, Terry and I went to the Washington State Hospital Association Rural Healthcare Leadership Conference. Um, 
at 4 p.m. today, like just uh, an hour before the meeting, I sent uh, everybody in the administration and the commissioners um, my notes and handouts that I got from there. Uh, there's some good stuff on there about rural finances, about safety, uh, AI and healthcare, how to do CEO evaluations, and uh, sort of reproductive services, especially how to how to kind of follow the Reproductive Privacy Act. There's some really good kind of uh, uh, practical suggestions on that. Um, and so that's my report. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but if any of you have any questions about it, uh, feel free to let me know. Obviously, there's no obligation to look at it, but I just wanted to make sure that anybody who wanted to see it could, could see it. Uh, and I also sent out something on the AHA. Yeah, it's long. Uh, <laughs> it's too long. It's out there. And it, but it took uh, it took me some time to 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 get rid of some of my uh, commentary, uh, especially in the AHA meeting in April. Um, a lot of stuff about Kevin, Kevin McCarthy, but I'll leave it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I had to cut a lot of that stuff out. Uh, but uh, but anyway, if you have any questions about that stuff, um, if you're interested in, in any of those issues, feel free to look it up. But like I said uh, in my message, if you're not interested, then just uh, get rid of it. Um, and feel free to send it to anybody else who might be interested. All right. Uh, Terry, anything to add about the meeting we went to? Well, since I'm on the governor's board committee for Washington State Hospital Association, one of the important things that they talked about is they think every hospital should have an AI policy. And uh, they said that they would send me uh, a, a policy that it's uh, an AI policy, and then I can... Uh, uh, give it to everybody to look at, and we could possibly draft one uh, because the AI policy also uh, should be dealt with with the quality improvement. But consequently, that's uh, about the only thing that uh, I knew about. Uh, since I'm on the governor's committee for Washington State Hospital Association, that was one of the biggest things they talked about was an AI policy. That's artificial intelligence. Well, it was just kind of a recommendation how you see it. And, and what you add to your AI, uh, because a lot of people in uh, the United States are worried about AI because there have been so many stories about how AI destroys all human beings because, well, yeah. um, <laughs> because they become the most important uh, uh, me uh, mechanical human being out there. Well, look, I mean, the, the main concern is that uh, when you put uh, stuff into these uh, into AI like large language model or whatever, um, you might be violating HIPAA because you know uh, these uh, systems learn from the information, and so they they sort of take this information to make future future predictions and things. And so the question is like, uh, are providers using this? How are they using this? What information are they putting into these into these things? And if it's uh, sensitive patient information, where is it going? You know. Um, so the, I mean, the big, the most important kind of most valuable thing now is patient data. Everybody wants it. All these companies want it. And so you just have to be careful about who's getting it and what they're doing with it, uh, because there may be some HIPAA issues there. And so the idea is, do we want to just let the individual providers sort of do their thing? Do we want to, and what they thought was it was better to have sort of a, a policy. But uh, Jeff, I, I don't know, you, you may have been thinking of about this or, or maybe not, but this is something certainly that uh, if we ever decided to do this as a, as a board that we would want to get your input on. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, you got the gist of it so far. So yeah, it's more around approved systems, um, you know, whether it's cloud-based or not, right? So, I mean, it, it's no different than what we we're putting up in the cloud today, that it has to be certified um, and whatnot. So uh, more to come on that, you know, my take is, is using right now is really using it for good, right? So how do we um, use it for efficiency and productivity type things? And um, but it has to go through the scrutiny of um, you know basically compliance, right? So yep, right. Yeah, and uh, AI and cybersecurity were really big topics at the AHA meeting in April, and then uh, AI was a, a big topic at the WISH meeting. So if you're interested in that issue, there's some stuff uh, in those notes that I sent. In. They did talk about one AI thing, uh, radiology uh, AI, uh, because uh, when you have a photograph that basically that's been from radiology, and then you have an AI uh, thing that looks at the photograph and it comes out and says, 
uh, this looks like this, this looks like this, this looks like this. And so then the radiologists, when they're going through their things, they're 100% sure that they've looked at that one dot, uh, thing that the AI suggested they look at. And then they can determine whether or not it really is what it is or not. Uh, but that was one of the things they talked about uh, using AI is that it can increase the quality of the radiology reviews uh, that, that so they might not miss some uh, picture uh, in one of the radiology things. So, right. So they were very much uh, here's some of the benefits or some of the advantages and here's right. some of the some of the concerns. Uh, but anyway, if you guys have any questions about uh, about those notes or about the handouts or things that, that I sent to you. Uh, if you are interested in that, feel free to ask me or, or Terry. Um, okay. And then on, uh, we have rural advocacy days in D.C., September 16th to 18th, if anybody is interested, although uh, I'm not sure a lot's going to get done in D.C. in, in this fall, uh, given all sorts of uncertainty. Uh, so keep that in mind. I'm not sure how much uh, how much is actually going to move the needle on anything there. Uh, but if you are interested, please, uh, please let us know. Uh, anything else for the good of the order before we go into executive session, board members? Okay. Uh, how long do we need? 15 minutes and no action anticipated. All right. Uh, so let's, let's take uh, nine minutes, 7.05, and then we'll go 15 minutes to 7.20 and reconvene there and no action anticipated. Thank you all for coming. And uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks for getting your Thank you. 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 Thank you.